Edmonia Lewis is recognised as the first person of colour to achieve international prominence as a sculptor. Lewis, also known as Wildfire, was born in 1844 near Albany, New York. Her mother, Catherine Mike Lewis, was of African Native American descent of the Mississauga tribe and had very good skills as a craftswoman and weaver. By the age of nine, Lewis's mother and father had both died and she and her half-brother Samuel were adopted by her two maternal aunts. For the next four years, Lewis and her aunts would sell baskets, moccasins and embroidered shirts to tourists visiting Niagara Falls, New York. Later, Lewis was able to go to college because her older brother had made a fortune in the California gold rush. After completing a three-year course at the Oberlin Academy Preparatory School, Lewis went to Oberlin College, one of the first higher education institutions in the United States to admit women and people of colour. It was here that Lewis began to study art. As one of only 30 students of colour out of 1,000 students, Lewis later spoke about the racial discrimination she faced and about the difficulties female students faced there, rarely being given an opportunity to participate in classroom discussions or public meetings. In 1862, just after the start of the US Civil War, Lewis was accused of poisoning her two female classmates who narrowly survived. Local authorities arrested her, but her lawyer, the first black lawyer in Ohio, managed to have her charges dismissed. Despite this acquittal, Lewis's time at college became so fraught with prejudice and difficulty that she was unable to graduate. In 2022, she was posthumously given the degree by Oberlin College. Lewis started her career as a sculptor after she moved to Boston in early 1864. Despite having connections to a network of abolitionists, finding a teacher was not easy. Three male instructors refused the role before sculptor Edward Augustus Brackett agreed to coach her. It was during this apprenticeship that Lewis started to make her own sculpting tools and sold her first piece, a woman's hand, for $8, before cutting ties with Brackett for reasons that are still unclear. In the same year, Lewis held her first solo exhibition and opened her studio to the public. She showcased marble busts of some of the most famous abolitionists of her day, including John Brown and Colonel Robert Goldshaw. It was from selling the bust of Shaw to the Colonel's family and plaster cast reproductions of it that Lewis was able to save enough money to move to Rome. The poet Anna Quincy Waterston wrote a poem about Lewis and the marble bust of the Colonel. She hath wrought well with her unpractised hand, the mirror of her thought reflected clear, this youthful hero martyr of our land. She goes on to write, "'Tis fitting that a daughter of the race whose chains are breaking should receive a gift so rare as genius." Although Lewis received a lot of attention in the abolitionist press and by many abolitionist writers, politicians, poets and artists, this praise was not always tied to her artistic merit, but rather as a way for white abolitionists to publicly declare their political intentions. In an interview in 1864 with fellow sculptor and friend Lydia Maria Child, Lewis explained, Some praise me because I am a coloured girl and I don't want that kind of praise. I had rather you point out my defects, for that will teach me something. In 1866, Lewis travelled to Rome, where she would spend most of her adult career. She worked in a space in the former studio of 18th century Italian sculptor Antonio Canova, alongside other expatriate sculptors. She explained, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my colour. Italy's less pronounced racism, in comparison to the United States, allowed Lewis to enjoy social, artistic and spiritual freedom and to become an independent international artist, rather than being dependent on abolitionist patronage. Also, as a Catholic, being in Rome was particularly significant for Lewis. It was in Rome that Lewis began sculpting in marble. Although she worked in the neoclassical manner, she focused on naturalism and depicted black and Native American people in her sculptures. Let's take a look at two key artworks by Lewis. This sculpture, made of over 3,000 pounds of marble, depicts the ancient Egyptian queen Cleopatra committing suicide by using the fatal bite of a poisonous snake. Lewis has chosen to show the queen's death more realistically than other contemporary depictions, which shocked audiences at the time. Art historian Charmaine Nelson has noted how Lewis may have navigated the strong associations between Cleopatra, blackness and the African continent. Lewis's white queen gained the aura of historical accuracy without sacrificing its symbolic links to abolitionism, black Africa and black diaspora. But what it refused to facilitate was the racial objectification of the artist's body. Lewis could not so readily become the subject of her own representation if her subject was corporally white. 
Lewis made this sculpture two years after the end of the US Civil War, and its title, Forever Free, was taken from Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, issued in 1863. It depicts a man standing with a broken chain hanging from his raised left arm. Next to him, a woman kneels in a prayer position. Art historian Charmaine Nelson explains, Unlike Thomas Ball's Emancipation Memorial and John Quincy Adam Ward's The Freed Man, Lewis's proud black male is not crouching at a benevolent Abraham Lincoln's feet, nor merely contemplating standing. Rather, Lewis's black male is erect and already clearly a man. With his foot trampling a ball and chain and his right hand caressing the woman's shoulder, they are one unit, a family, and he is their protector, a status strategically denied to black males within transatlantic slavery. Some modern scholars have commented on the fact that both figures have Eurocentric features, and it's certainly important to emphasise here that Lewis was working in a very restricted, codified artistic language at the time, not just within neoclassicism, but also one that was moulded by pressures to gain patrons and build a reputation as an artist. At the peak of Lewis's career, male sculptors often accused female sculptors of not doing their own work. And it was partly for this reason that Lewis did not hire studio assistants to help her enlarge clay and wax models in marble, instead doing it all herself. As she grew in popularity, she had many major exhibitions, including in Chicago in 1870 and Rome in 1871, and she earned large sums of money from commissions and sales. In 1871, an article in the Wisconsin State Journal reported, There is something in human nature which makes everyone admire a brave and heroic spirit. The hour of applause has come to Edmonia Lewis. This hour of applause, however, did not seem to last very long. Lewis's artwork became less popular in the 1880s as neoclassicism was declining in popularity. And increasingly, Lewis was overlooked and excluded by the art world. She did, however, continue to create marble sculptures, particularly altarpieces and other works for Catholic patrons. From 1896, she lived in Paris, and then in 1901, she moved to London. She died there in 1907 of chronic kidney failure and was buried in St Mary's Catholic Cemetery in London. Her grave was restored after a crowdfunding campaign in 2017.